to take a sip of water before I hit record, but here we are. <sighs> Ain't nothing like water, man, I'm telling you. Hi, my name is Alana. Welcome to my YouTube channel. And on this channel, <laughs> we review books. Um, you know what's funny? I got a comment. I thought there was a fly. Sorry. I was like, how did you get in here? Um, I got a comment on my Earthlings review where the person was like, I'm two minutes in and you're not reviewing the book. So I, I left. I'm leaving or something like that. Bebe, <laughs> this is not an airport. You do not need to announce your arrival and departure. We don't care. We don't care. Um, you must be new here because... So people like my rambling and I'm not changing it. I'm not changing it. I like my rambles. What you're seeing is how my brain actually works. I'm not editing that out. I think it's entertaining. And if you don't like it, I'm not the reviewer for you. There's the door. I don't care. My feelings are not hurt. Also, when you leave a comment, FYI, this is just for anybody. If you're watching somebody's content you just don't care for, don't comment. <laughs> don't like, don't dislike. It's all algorithm friendly. Um, if there's a creator I'm just not into, I just don't give them my social currency. I just quietly leave. I don't need to announce it. Again, like I said, this is not an airport. Incoming, departing. No one needs to know. We don't care. <laughs> it just, I get I get a good chuckle when I see stuff like that. I really do. Because I'm thinking, baby, you really had, you really gonna stop and leave that comment? Did you? Okay, but you know, maybe I'm not for you. I'm not for you. I understand I'm not everybody's cup of tea and that's no skin off my nose. That doesn't hurt my feelings but I think it's funny. Like just free advice. If you're not feeling somebody's content, don't leave a comment. That's it. Today's video, I am going to re be reviewing a reread, Voyager by Diana Gabaldon. This is the third installment of the Outlander trilogy. Trilogy, the Outlander series, definitely not a trilogy. She's got so many books. I started reading Outlander in 20, at the end of 2015 as pure escapism. I didn't even know what Outlander was. I didn't know that it was a series at the time. I did not know anything. I, I like historical fiction and I decided to pick it up. A friend that I went to college with had posted it on her Instagram back in like, again, 2015. And she was like, oh, this is just a fun read. And when I looked it up, I was like, that sounds fun. Let's try it. And it was just what I needed at the time when I read the first book, pure escapism. But now, and I've only read up to the first three books. Um, I read the first book in 2015, the second in 2016, and the third in 2017 initially. But by the time I, I got to, to Voyager, I didn't remember a lot of it. Because again, 2017 was not a fun year for me. <laughs> it was very stressful. And so I had gaps in my memory from this book. And so I had already decided to, that I wanted to complete the whole series. And when I chose to reread this series, when did I start rereading it? 2021. Um, wait a minute. No, no, 2022. I'm, I'm losing track of time. I realized that Diana Gabaldon is weaving... <laughs> is a very complex writer and she's very detailed. And I think that these, that, that because this book was categorized as romance for so long, these books were categorized as romance so long, they don't necessarily get the justice. They're not necessarily getting the respect that they deserve. Now, if you don't like them, that's fine. Like nothing is for everybody, but Diana Gabaldon is very, very intelligent the way that she constructs these stories. And um, that's why now they are under general fiction because you can't box these books into one category. Let's stop rambling. Let's jump into this because Voyager has so many good themes. And at this point, especially now, if you're clicking on a video for a review from like the third book in a series, there's going to be some spoilers. So they're not major spoilers. I really do not try not to spoil too much, but you'll see just in my intro, I cannot not say it because uh, when I do this, the um, synopsis of this particular book, because it's critical to the whole story. So that writing novels was a cannibal's art in which one often mixed small portions of one's friends and others, one's enemies together, seasoned them with imagination and allowed the whole to stew together into a savory concoction. So in Voyager by Diana Gabaldon, like I said, the third installment of the Outlander series, it is 20 years post the Battle of Culloden. 
which was one, it, that was the most fam- famous Jacobite rebellion in Scottish history. There were others, but that one's the most well-known. And Claire and Jamie are our main pro, ma- main female and male protagonists in Love Interests have been separated post the Battle of Culloden for 20 years. Claire thinks Jamie has been killed. And however, she does discover that he survived. So she returns to Scotland. After 20 years, the two do reconnect. However, they face the challenge of of familiarizing themselves. That's a hard word to say out loud with each other in the midst of chaos. So when she goes back to Jamie, Jamie's not chilling. Like Jamie is always going to be busy doing something. And Jamie is a chaotic character in some cases. Like he, he's never drama free. <laughs> so Claire gets automatically pulled back into his drama. And it takes them in this chaos that Jamie is in, takes them out of Scotland to a more tropical environment. And if you know, I don't think that you have to even read the Outlander series to know that they end up in the colonies. So, but before they get to the colonies, they still, they go to the Caribbean. That's, you know, it is just like, what it's actually very, very jarring to the reader at first when this happens. Cause you're like, you spend so much time in Scotland that in the, with the, with Diana Galbadon almost makes the climate of Scotland a character. And then when you go back to the Caribbean, you're like, what happened? It's, it's shocking. So like I say, it's easy to like, every time I review an Outlander book, I say that it's easy to brush these off as historical romances. Yes, it is a historical romance, but Diana Gawain is exploring way more than that. Way more complex questions with Jamie. And, and it's just that Jamie and Claire's relationship is at the center. Claire is a time traveler and Gabaldon is using Claire in her journey to ask how is history written? So Claire has the ability to see how events actually unfolded. So she knows how history turned up. So when she goes back to history, she's just seeing how it's playing out. And so Claire's able to compare how it actually played out and how historians have decided to record it. So Diana Gabaldon is asking how history is written, what elements are coming together to piece together the story. That means there wasn't a great distinction made between stories about real people, stories of historical figures. Sometimes it was a combination of fact and myth, and sometimes you could tell that it was a real historical occurrence being described. Though I'm not sure it's all that easy to tell the difference between romance and fine print. Well, legends are many legged beasties but they generally have at least one foot on the truth. That was a quote from Jamie. I can't say it in Jamie's epic accent, but you know. In the world of Outlander, there are instances in which history and myth do overlap. There there is a bit of magical realism in these stories. I wouldn't call them fantasy, but definitely magical realism. So even in these three books, the first three books of the series, and I don't know if the rest, the remainder of the books remain this cryptic, but there are rules to this world. Clearly Claire is a time traveler. So we're dealing with some fantastical elements and it does leave the reader in a state of limbo up to this book because you don't, we don't know all the rules. I don't know if we're ever going to know all the rules and it, it, it does, it's very smartly done on, on Gawain's part because it does create a this tension and this dramatic irony while we're as for the reader and and it kind of keeps you going because you're thinking well how is this how does this world how is this world coming together this fantastical world but that being said diana diana gabaldon does ask throughout the series clearly the supernatural exists but what is its purpose what, and what are the limitations of science? Because not all things can be explained. Well, I say it is the place of science only to observe, he said, to seek cause where it can be found, but to realize that there are many things in the world for which no one, sorry, which no cause shall be found, not because it does not exist, but because we know too little to find it. It is not the place of science to insist on explanation, but only to observe in hopes that the explanation will manifest itself. That may be science, that may be science, but it isn't human nature, I objected. That's Claire objecting to 
a scientist that she's talking with. People go on wanting explanations. But a scientist could not say, could he? What is it the Bible, the Christian Bible says? Blessed are they who have not seen, but have believed. So one element of Outlander as a whole is this idea of fate. Because, and that is the crux of Jamie and Claire's relationship. You have the situation in which it happens, in, it's the crux of the first book, it's the whole series, where certain, sort, certain, my face is so itchy. First, I can't speak. There had to be a certain, things had to line up perfectly for these two people to meet across space and time. And so things that are meant to happen will find a way to happen. For two people connect to connect in this way, it was fate. However, when it comes to history, Jamie and Claire, Jamie and Claire are constantly wondering because obviously Jamie, Jamie knows that Claire is from the 20th century. Um, they're trying to figure out if history's outcomes are fated and destined to happen or if there are some things that can still be tinkered with. Claire can't figure this out as a time traveler if her presence in the past has affected history. Also, we see this, and Claire makes note of this through the series, she says, or through this book in particular, she looks at people and she's like, some people were just destined to do certain things. It seems that way, but is that really true? She's battling with this idea the whole, the whole story, particularly in Voyager, because again, she's been separated from Jamie for 20 years and then she's able to reconnect with him. Again, because it was destined to happen, but are all things destined to happen? This is an open-ended question. Or was there some sort of family predisposition for some kinds of work? Were some people actually born to be smiths or merchants or cooks, born to an inclination and an aptitude as well as to the opportunity? He had been born a leader, then bent and shaped further to, sit, to fit such a destiny. But what of a man who had not been born to the hole he was required to fill? I had been settled for 20 years, rooted as a barnacle to my attachments. Now fate in my own actions had ripped me loose from all those things, and I felt as though I were tumbling free in the surf, at the mercy of forces a great deal stronger than myself. Again, to kind of elaborate on that further, Claire is trying to figure out if history is inevitable. Because obviously, so in the second book, Jamie and Claire do everything they can and when you kind of think about it, it's definitely meager attempts to to prevent the Battle of Culloden because Claire knows just how devastating it was to the clans. Um, and obviously it didn't work. And so she's still thinking like, well, is just because that could be changed, are there other things that are not set in stone? And she's clearly able to travel back and forth, but even that has its limitations. And she's thinking, well, clearly I'm here. What impact has my presence had? Or am I just being pulled along with everything else and my presence has no significant impacts whatsoever? Gotta take a sip of water. I am, my throat is really dry. <clears throat> Look at this, this is fun. Ballet, like a sport, only harder. Dancers are athletes. I said what I said. It takes a lot of strength to balance on the tips of your toes and then look like you are not in pain while doing so. <laughs> Ballet is a bit masochistic. I admit that. I admit that. I asked my, my instructor that I was like, especially when we're doing, for me, I'm a recreational dancer. This is just my form of poison when it comes to staying in shape. Um, I'm in the best shape of my life, to be honest, and I still have goals I want to hit, but this is a ramble. But, um, I was, this was months ago. I was like, there's gotta be, there's a bit of masochism involved with ballet, especially when it comes to the decision to get on point, because this is not my profession. I do it for fun. I don't have to get on point, but it's a goal I've always had. She was like, yeah, you're right. Because when she was dancing all the time, of course she's, you know, and she was auditioning for companies and all that stuff when she was a lot younger. She's old enough to be my mother. She said that there is a rush to it. There is a rush to it. Um, especially once you get on point. It is so satisfying, but so painful at the same time. And you know what you're doing is 
hard on the body, but so good at the same time. Anyway, it's it's a rush. It's a rush. Let's go back to Claire and um, her thinking about if she's just a wisp of wind in this in 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 the 18th century, or if she's actually making an impact. I wondered my I wondered whether my own anachronistic presence would cause as little harm. I pulled that little one liner because at this point she just returned to Scotland from Boston and she dropped like a handkerchief or something and it was she just watched it kind of roll away and that's not going to leave an impact on anything and she's thinking is that what my existence is in the past or is my existence much more impactful than that. I'm going to say this not in Jamie's Highland dialect because I can't do it. And one thing I'm not going to do is butcher somebody else's dialect. I'm just not going to do it. So I'm going to, I'm going to just going to speak it as I would normally. Some say it's doomed. Whatever you see that that was must come to pass. But others say it's not but a warning. Take heed and you can change things. What do you think yourself? I'd always thought that of course you could change things if you knew about them. But now I don't know. Somewhere deep inside, I knew it would make no difference. Would not help in any way. Wouldn't do nothing but harm. But yet I could not stand here consenting by silence. It was not for the it was not for the branded girls, the man on the block, not for any of them that I did the, did it. It was for myself. Also, lastly, one thing that Diana Gabaldon mentions in and it's a running theme throughout the whole series that I've read so far, the first three books, that our modern society is not necessarily more civilized and safer than the past. The past was a dangerous country, but even the advances of so-called civilization were no guarantee of safety. Civilized warfare was, if anything, more horrifying than its older versions. Daily life might be safer, but only if one Cho- if only one chose one's walk in it with care. Now, Claire was a combat nurse in World War II. And so she saw the horrors of World War II. And so for her, she's like, human nature is going to human nature. Human nature is always going to find a way to be destructive. And actually with modern warfare and technology, it gets worse. You know, yeah, Bat, uh, face-to-face combat with could you imagine face-to-face combat with swords how gruesome that is like you are making physical contact with that other body but think about also just the mass destruction of atomic bombs and uh, automatic weapons and machine guns and tanks it, it, it's just death is death and unfortunately with with technology you know, man has created even more gruesome ways to kill other people. Like death is death and horror is horror. And that just because, you know, we have sanitation, better sanitation and, you know, safer structures and whatever, doesn't mean that life is necessarily safer. This is interesting. Again, this is one of my, so this is an interesting conversation that one of my ballet mates and I were having. And she was like, she actually thinks that modern society in a lot of ways is lonelier. We have, we're actually more connected than ever, but lonelier um, because the community has broken down. We no longer, none of us live in tribal societies anymore. We're not living in a clan like society. You know, we're not living in villages. We're somehow all packed together, especially we live in a city. We're packed together, but somehow farther apart than ever. We're so isolated. Whereas I know people who live in very rural areas, but they have a different type of community. It's very fascinating. So anyway, opening a question, let me get the last quote and then I'm going to tie this all up. I could not reach them in time. I thought I was resigned. I thought I had resigned myself to the realities of this time, but knowing even as I, even as I held the twitching body of an 18 year old seaman as his bowels dissolved in blood and water, the penicillin would have saved most of them, and I had none, was galling as an ulcer, eating at my soul. So Claire was a nurse. She ends up becoming a doctor, and she does know that, so in, a, in our modern society, medicine has been able to achieve so much, and she took a vow as a doctor that says she'll do no harm. And so for her to go back in the past and not be able to, as a doctor, heal them, that is a different type of torture for her. So this is also kind of 
goes back into is our modern society society safety and also goes to this theme that Diana Gowden talks about because Claire's a time traveler as it's the weight of knowing it's like man this person couldn't help the time and the place in which they were born and they just have to be excuse me subject to the horrors of whatever space and time in which they were born so this was actually my second reread of that Voyager like I said and the first time I read it the scenery was jarring. So you go from the Americas. So you go to like 20th century Boston in the 70s, the 60s, not the 70s, the 60s. And you go to back to 18th century Scotland. Then she takes you to the Caribbean. Then you end up in the colonies. And that's where the, why am I so aggressive? That's where the fourth book, here, the blue one, the light blue one right here. That's where the fourth book picks up. In the colonies and it's jarring at first because in the first two books you spend so much time in Scotland though in the this book you the second one you spend quite a bit of time in Paris but it's jarring and the first time I read it I was like take me back the second time I appreciate it the way that Diana Gowden makes the tropical environment in the Caribbean its own living breathing character there's this really epic scene with the cave I just it didn't, it didn't, it actually fit. It actually fit. So I really appreciated it. And I, and again, it highlighted to me just how talented Diana Gowden as a writer. She is just a, a talented storyteller. Um, I like to read these books as a form of escapism when I just want to read something that's fun, but still smart. Um, I love these characters. They're dynamic. They're very complex. They're very, com they're very um, imperfect. Um, the plot is always going. This is a thick book. This is over a thousand pages long. It did take me some time to get through it, but not once was I bored. And I can't wait to start reading the fourth book because I'm going to finally be in unfamiliar territory with this story. I have not re watched the series past the third season and I don't want to. I'm going to stick with the books. I don't really watch a lot of TV and I'm, a, I'm that person. I want to read the book first. And I'm going to be really curious to see how in the fourth book, I know Native Americans enter into the to the plot, East Coast tribes, Hala. And I'm going to be curious to know how she's going to handle that. I know she did a lot of research. Um, Diana Gabaldon does a lot of research to get the dialects as accurately as she accurate as she can. And when she did the dialects for the Native American tribes that come into the story, she talked to elders from these tribes and stuff. So I'm really curious to see how she's going to do that. Um, and I know that the Revolutionary War will take place sometime in this series, but I'm now in uncharted territory and I'm looking forward to that. Probably won't pick this up until at least next year, but hey, I gave this a four and a half out of five. I just really appreciate these stories and I'm just going to leave it at that. Are you into the Outlander stories? Is it your jam? Is it not your jam? That's fine. How Are you like, I want to watch the show versus reading the book? Let me know. Holla. Um, leave me a comment. Feel free to like, subscribe. And also feel free to follow me on Instagram where I get up to more bush, bookish shenanigans. All of my content goes there first. And I occasionally post goofy things in the Instagram stories because life is hard and we all need a good chuckle. That's all. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.